Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this NCAA tournament final four weekend. And what a weekend we've got on tap. On tap in our panels here, as always, our experts, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Tony Mejia, a playbook expert, and our writer for the Sporting News, along with our producer, Greg De Palma from Prime Sports Network, Jim Feist, our good buddy, is AWOL. He's got a little bit of a health issue going on, and he'll be joining us probably in next week's podcast, I'm sure. I wish him the best for sure. As we tip off the podcast this week, as we did a couple of weeks ago, I want to welcome in our good friend, if I may, Jordan Reed from uwager.lv. Uwager.lv is the only sports book that I, Mark Lawrence, personally endorse. You've heard about them all year long here on the podcast, and we want to get a view from Jordan about what's going on at uwager.lv heading into this final four weekend. Jordan, how was your Sweet 16 weekend last weekend? Oh, it was great. The tournament's always really exciting. We had a lot of promos going on, a lot of action. People people always get up for these games. Yeah, it's not hard to get up for these games, that's for sure. You know, unless you're obviously not a basketball fan. Uh, and before we went on, you mentioned about uh, the big incentives and uh, the bonuses you're offering. And uh, it kind of opens the doors for a lot of people. Can you let our listeners know a little bit about what offers or bonuses you're offering to them to join you this weekend for the final four weekend? Well, if you want to try us out, you can use um, your code playbook um, and playbook will get you a 70% free play bonus with just a one time roll, no hold. So you can really come in 70% free play on your first deposit, play it, try us out. We're sure you'll like us and stick around. But if not, you, it's got a very low rollover. One time roll is almost nothing. And as we've mentioned before in the past at uwager.lv, you can log on the site at uwager.lv or give them a call at 1-800-U-WAGER. A lot of other advantages other than just the sign-up bonuses. Uh, you get free same-day payouts uh, from uwager.lv. Also, you can qualify for a 5% rebate at uwager.lv. You can check it out all online on their website at uwager.lv. Jordan, I would know I wanted to know, and I know our listeners out there probably do too. We're at the stage of the season now where a lot of money has been wagered uh, from the start of the tournament until this weekend. Is of these four teams that are going to be playing this weekend, which one of these four teams is the biggest risk for you wager this weekend? Uh, it's definitely UConn. We have more money on UConn than than all the rest of them at this point. And is that what you may call smart money or would you call it public money or a combination of everything? I think it's a combination of everything. I mean, um, definitely the public has been on UConn since the start, um, but some of the some of the big betters have as well. Yeah, they, I'm sure the smart guys got on them early when the price was right. Uh, some of the uh, other, you know, some, some of the more Joe Squares probably hopped on them once the tournament began in that sense that way, but you're going to probably be rooting for Alabama. I'm going to guess this week. And uh, with that, I'm going to share a stat with you about Alabama. I know Andy wants to share something with you. You can take it to the guys at the counter there and let them know why I feel Alabama is going to upset UConn. And Andy Isco might have something to say. He might not feel the same way, but at least he has a stat or something about that. Uh, but if you take a look at uh, what Alabama has done, remember last year, everybody forgets, that this team was the number one seed in the whole tournament last year that won 31 basketball games and they got beat by San Diego state in the semifinals. That's the same or sweet 16. I should say that's the same San Diego state team that went to the finals against UConn last year. And if you take a look here uh, at what they've done so far from a three point percentage, they're the only team in this tournament left in the tournament whose three point percentage shooting within the tournament is better than it's been for the season. Uh, I think you're going to find a geeked up Alabama basketball team here this weekend. And my other side of this, and we'll get into this more under the show, is that in UConn, you know, they basically pitch no hitters each and every game. And it's my Johnny Vandermeer theory. How many no hitters can you keep throwing back to back to back to back? Eventually, they're going to have a bad game, and I think it'll come against the likes of Alabama. Now, that's my personal take. Andy, what do you think about Alabama? Maybe not so much against UConn, but something you had to say about Alabama. Well, actually, uh, Mark it, uh, and Jordan, it, it relates to double-digit favorites in uh, the uh, final two rounds of the tournament and in the final four 
Remember, you've got four excellent teams that have already won four games, eliminations, so the seasons are over. Well, when I take a look, and there's not a lot of history, but when you take a look at uh, teams that have uh, had double-digit favorites, I believe it's something like, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to remember, I think they're like eight, I think they're like eight and two straight up, but um, uh, along the lines of, I think there's only been, uh, most of those games have been decided by single digits, eight points or less. Um, I'll see if I can get a hold of that for a little bit later because I wasn't sure that you were going to be asking me about this at this point. But the point is that double-digit favorites do not fare well uh, against uh, against the spread, and there have been quite a number of upsets uh, where double-digit favorites have lost outright. But the key thing is that double-digit favorites, uh, when they win, the vast majority of times, that's not a huge sample, but the vast majority of times, it's by single digits. Good news. I think good news, that at least for those at UWager.LV. And uh, before I let Jordan go, uh, anything uh, from our panel here, Greg or Tony, that you might want to ask Jordan from a sportsbook standpoint? Well, I, I wanted to, of course, college basketball on the women's side has never been more popular as far as I've remembered. Uh, they're getting big numbers marketing-wise, traffic and all that. People are watching like never before. Has that translated to the wagering business, as far as you know? It is starting to pick up, yes. Um, we're seeing as much as much rights on some of the women's games as, as regular college men's games. So that's good. Cool. Jordan, who's number two in terms of uh, volume behind UConn, Purdue? Purdue, correct. You know, the two big number one seeds, ironically, <laughs> the ones who look like they're destined to clash. But uh, uh, either way, if one, if they do clash, Jordan, it might not be a good Monday night for everybody <laughs> at you wager. But <laughs> we'll see if there's an upset or two along the way before they get to Monday night. It'll be fun we, to watch anyway. Yeah, for sure. It'll be fun to watch for sure. Well, Jordan, I want to thank you for your time. This is Jordan Reed we've been talking with uh, from uwager.lv. Be sure to take advantage of that big 70% bonus that they're offering. Uh, just log on at uwager.lv or give them a call at uwager.lv and use the password playbook, and they'll take care of you from a sign-up bonus standpoint. Best of luck to you this weekend, Jordan, and we'll catch up with you down the road. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you. That was Jordan Reed joining us from uwager.lv. And with that, guys, Let's get into a little bit, if we may, of uh, a little bit of an overview of what's happened uh, uh, so far in the basketball tournament. Uh, anything I might ask, uh, Tony, you, that has caught your eye in particular? I know we talked uh, a, a little bit of, uh, last week about uh, s some upstart teams, and I think NC State's going to be the obvious. You know, the, the team that's here that shouldn't be. There's always a team here that shouldn't be, but they are, and maybe uh, deservedly so. But anything else that uh, you think – uh, was a little bit uh, out of the ordinary that's happened so far in the tournament. Well, no, look, I, I'm, I'm taking nothing away from NC State. They've been tremendous when they had to be. They have veterans. You know, it, it's funny that DJ Burns has been around for so long. I, I forgot that he started at Tennessee. I remember him at Winthrop because he had so much success there. Uh, but I, I saw like a retrospective on his career where he was actually slim in his first year at Tennessee. Uh, and, and then he put on the weight at... Uh, at, Win at Winthrop, uh, and it, it really, really uh, rendered him very effective there. But I think uh, if he wants to be a pro, he needs to slim down about 40 pounds. But that, that's either here nor there for the, for the college game. Uh, but, yeah, they've, de they've definitely merited their spot. Um, for me, it was tremendously disappointing to see Jamal Shedd uh, go down because I obviously had Houston winning it all, and they were up on Duke. They would have beaten Duke in that game. And then it would have been a very interesting matchup with NC State uh, in that uh, regional final. But obviously, Shed goes down. He was irreplaceable for them as both a, a standout defender and a playmaker and a finisher. And they just couldn't replace him. Uh, so th that was tough to watch. Uh, you know, beyond that, it's been it's been a heck of a tournament. I think Zach Eady and, and his ability to dominate has been special. I mean, uh, I, I know he took a lot of slack for not picking up many fouls and drawing so many on the balls. Uh, Dalton Connect obviously played a, a hell of a game in that one. Uh, but, you know, he's he's been, to his credit, uh, able to avoid that foul trouble. And I think that's, that, that was what I thought would, uh, would lead to an early exit for them. Um, not that he can't be replaced because they have way more depth there than uh, Matt Painter has had in quite some time. 
but the fact that he's been able to stay on the court and dominate in the, in the manner that he has, um, has has been a difference maker. Uh, and certainly if he wasn't as effective as he was last Sunday, uh, I think Tennessee would be in the final four right now. So, um, yeah, but again, we've had uh, we've had a lot of favorites win. I think the public has cleaned up. I didn't ask Jordan that, but, um, you know, from all my sportsbook follows and, and the people I talk to, it's been a very public tournament where favorites have covered the number most uh, most of the time. Uh, and and again, we got two number one seeds. The teams that were expected to be here for the large part are except for Houston. And uh, I'm looking forward to these uh, semifinals. Very good. That was Tony Mejia, Playbook Experts, with his brief overview of what's happened so far in the NCAA basketball tournament. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And Andy, I'm going to ask you the same question. What has been uh, caught your attention that you thought were a little bit surprised that you weren't expecting to see in the tournament this year? Well, I think the uh, first thing that comes to mind is the quality of play we saw out of the ACC this year. They had five teams invited to the tournament. Uh, the first yes. team did not give a very good signal for the future fates of the ACC as Virginia looked absolutely ugly in the um, uh, uh, in, in the opening playing around loss uh, that Virginia had to, uh, I think it was Colorado State, if I recall correctly. And then the ACC, North Carolina, North Carolina State, Duke, and Clemson, uh, they go 4-0 in each of the first two rounds. Uh, the uh, and then in the uh, Sweet 16, of course, uh, North Carolina uh, loses, and then Clemson uh, and uh, Duke lost in the last round. So they've done outstanding thus far this season. Now, overall, the field as a whole, the Final Four field, obviously they're 16 and 0 straight up. But to Tony's point, they're also 15 and 1 against the spread. The only team not to cover in the game, and that was by just a half a point was when North Carolina State defeated Oakland laying six and a half, and they won 79-73. So they were almost a perfect 16-0 against the spread as well. I did want to go back and uh, uh, mention about what I was talking about before. I was actually taking a look in rounds five and six when the lines uh, were greater or uh, equal or greater than nine, so just under double digits, uh, because we do have a, a nine-point line in the uh, Purdue uh, game uh, this week against uh, NC State. Uh, those teams, um, of, of the teams that were nine, favorites have won straight up. There was one underdog that won. In fact, that was Duke back in 1991, uh, putting an end to UNLV's chances of repeating as uh, back-to-back champions. They were nine-and-a-half-point dogs, and Duke won that game outright. Uh, but the other three favorite, the other four favorites that, uh, uh, or the four favorites that won uh, as uh, laying nine or more, uh, they they did win, but they were just one and three against the spread. Now, when we get to the uh, final round, the championship game, so these teams are now 5-0 and oh straight up. Since uh, the field expanded to 64 in 1985, there have been three instances of uh, favorites in championship games of nine points or, uh, or greater. The first was actually in 1985 when Villanova pulled that stunning upset against uh, Georgetown. Uh, the other occurred... Uh, the other two occurred in the late 1990s. Kentucky won but failed to cover in a win over Syracuse. And then uh, Connecticut, the first time it won the national championship, they were a. Uh, teams were plus or minus nine or greater. You guys Marches there? Have been two, six, four, seventeen, and three. So four of those five occurrences, the the uh, final margins have been uh, single digits. And then when you take a look at those three championship games I mentioned, um, when Villanova pulled the upset of Georgetown, they won by two. When Kentucky won but didn't cover against Syracuse in the 1996 championship game, they won by nine. And when UConn won in 1999, that first championship, they won by three. So although the favorites may have some success, you bet the underdog in these high-priced games, the game expected to be sessions or more, if you're getting, uh, uh, you know, nine or more, uh, it seems to be the teams 
that have earned it away. You know, maybe a win or two in the first round or two is a bit of a fluke, but if you've won five straight games to get to the championship game, it's hard to justify, as, as well as that favorite, in this case Connecticut and to a lesser extent Purdue, have been playing. These other, these other teams have earned their way to there, and there's no reason not to expect them to be just as competitive. Now, that may all go to waste this year, and we may see Connecticut and Purdue win in blowouts, but that's not necessarily you want to bet them when you consider all the factors uh, other than what we've seen on the court that suggest these should be competitive games. Andy Isco, with his review of what he's seen thus far in the NCAA basketball tournament, Greg De Palma, Prime Sports Network. I know you're a big basketball fan. What's caught your fancy this year? Uh, well, I mean, exactly what Jordan said. It was not surprising to hear about the fact that there have been a lot of favorites. We talked about that last week, uh, how uh, rare it was to see that there was only one seed over the, f the top four in each region that had kind of made it through to the Sweet 16. So, um, and that's kind of hold. That kind of held true a little bit, even though we we did lose uh, some of the ones and twos. So I think that, but that's going to happen. There's only four left. And and remember, we were wondering, well, is this going to be the year that we're going to get all four one seeds and that kind of thing? Well, no, it just doesn't work out that way. So I'm glad that we have a little bit of um, some underdog flavor to the final four because. I do look at this Final Four, and I think that there is a legitimate chance that we could see any combination, and that includes Alabama versus NC State. So, um, and, and we talked about this uh, about a month ago when we were going over what do you look at when you talk about uh, handicapping college basketball at this time of year. And one of the things that we brought up was how important it is uh, – to handicap on the side of teams that have a lot of senior leadership, a lot of experience playing together. And I think that's the thing, if anything, that's going to favor Alabama against against UConn if they have an opportunity to win the game because five of their top six players are seniors, where UConn, I believe, three of their top five are underclassmen. So maybe that will work in Alabama's favor. And then, of course, NC State and Purdue, um, I can't be obviously happier to see what the Wolfpack have done and what a story that could be if they can reach the final after just being in the final four is an incredible story because uh, most people, unless you're diehard, that's just a regular you know, you know, sports Joes that'll turn on the final four and watch here and there. They, they, they have no idea uh, how NC State even got here based on a last-second three to go to overtime in the semifinals of the ACC tournament or else they wouldn't even be here. So, pretty crazy. Yes, it is pretty crazy. That's what the Mar March Madness tournament is all about. Uh, you know, as I had mentioned on our podcast last week, uh, at this time of the year, I, what I do is I chart every team's performance with each game all throughout the tournament here. I shared with you last week about defense and what it means in this tournament. And uh, just to update you with these four teams that have made the final four, uh, the number one scoring team thus far in the tournament is Alabama. They've averaged 89.8 points per game in the tournament. The number one team in total of defense is UConn, their opponent, who is allowing just 57 or 52.8 points per game. So it's going to be a matter of pitching versus hitting in this game. Which, which of the two do you like better here? You take a look at the other two uh, teams from the other basketball game, NC State scoring 75.5 at a clip, allowing 65.5 a clip, and Purdue 84 points a game even, and they were allowing just 62.8 points per game. So that's it from the statistical side of things. Uh, one thing that Greg mentioned here, I want to share with our listeners out there and our viewers out there, Greg mentioned, mentioned that the, any possibility is, is likely in this scenario here. And if you take a look at odds, current odds of exact results, you, you know, where you have an opportunity to bet an exact matchup and an exact result, these are what they are, uh, these exact matchups and their odds. If UConn were to beat Purdue, if you want to play that, you got to lay minus 115 to do that. That's obviously the two number one seeds. If Purdue were to beat UConn, the other way around, you get plus 320. If UConn were to beat NC State, you get plus 450. If Purdue beats Alabama, you'd get plus 950. Alabama beats Purdue, you get plus 2,000. NC State beats UConn, you get plus 2,200. Alabama beats NC State, that's good for plus 3,500. And the big bonanza is if NC State beats Alabama, you get plus 6,000. So if you've got a 
if you're a fortune teller and you can tell exactly who you think is going to be playing in these futures here, you can also wager on these exact results. You, you know, Mark, excuse me. It seems I, I wonder if that's it seems that it's more likely that North Carolina State would beat UConn than North Carolina State would beat Alabama. That seems a little I would think those have to be reversed. Or wouldn't they be? Well, you've got uh, you're talking about NC State. Yeah. It shows NC State to beat UConn is only plus 2,200, yes. but to beat Alabama is plus 6,000. Wouldn't it be the other way that it would be plus 6,000 to beat uh, the better team UConn? Yeah, I would think so, too. These are all from DraftKings, and it's where I pulled them down from. And uh, Well, that, those, are the, those are the – basically what it's saying is, is that the likelihood of NC State – and Alabama playing, Alabama. playing yeah. in the championship game is so far out of anybody's mind that what, even the if they get there, it's it. it'd be, that's, that's, what, that's why the odds are where they are. They don't expect probably, Alabama probably, to beat UConn. Yeah. Probably also seeding related. You know, Alabama, obviously, it's it's tough to see them winning, although they have a great shot. Uh, but no, that and, makes sense. You're, you're looking at two major upsets yeah, correct. in these Saturday games. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That, right. That, that, Sort of, I mean, it just seems like it's a huge discrepancy between the two. But then again, well, they're they're both pretty similar, similarly priced as far as the upsets go, because the spread is only a couple of points apart in both games. Although it's a significant difference, you know, plus twelve for uh, um, for Alabama against UConn versus plus nine nine and a half for NC State against Purdue. Yeah, if you want to go out on that limb and say that NC State uh, will beat Alabama, you're putting Alabama into the championship game. UConn figures to be in the championship game, so hence the price is shorter there that way from a, uh, from a risk standpoint. And Tony mentioned about uh, from a seed standpoint, this is kind of interesting here. When you add up all the seeds of who these teams have played and who they beat thus far to get here so far, uh, you look at uh, NC State has faced the toughest competition in the tournament so far in the sense that their seed numbers, the numbers of the seeds of the teams they beat totals 26. Purdue's next with 31, Alabama 32, and UConn 33. Now, those numbers only sort of figured because NC State being a double-digit seed was beating teams that were seeded higher than they were. But it's NC State that's really done the, the yeoman's work so far to get here. And so by seed numbers here, UConn has had the easiest path so far, at least by seed numbers. Which at the same time means that NC State – has been a weaker quality set of quality teams compared to uh, the other teams because as an 11 seed, uh, you you haven't faced as many. Uh, well, I'm sorry, UConn has faced the the lesser quality teams because their yes. seeds add up to the uh, higher number. Exactly right. Right. It, 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 it's yeah. The the worse the competition, the higher the number. Exactly. Right. Right. Although although it's not a huge difference, certainly between those bottom three teams, the Purdue. Uh, uh, Connecticut and um, Alabama compared to uh, NC State, but what is it? Uh, Twenty six, I think you said for NC State and thirty three for uh, UConn. And uh, thirty three for UConn on the opposite end, correct? Yeah, so not a huge difference, but you're talking four games. That still means that NC State has still overall played the easier competition. Well, the, the, the funny oh, thing sorry, about Connecticut, UConn... Connecticut's played the UConn's played it, yeah. The, the funny thing to me about UConn is, I, I mean, look, I, I can I can say, yeah, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're facing a first time team in Stetson then they're facing a Northwestern team that went to overtime with FAU and, you know, com very competitive, beat Purdue this year. But again, you can poo poo that too. San Diego State, not as good as it were last year, even though they were a national runner up. Uh, but obviously the bar set that high and, and they lost some key guys. So you beat them as badly as, as they did. But the 30 to nothing run, I think, was what probably sets them up to be this prohibited favorite because Illinois is a quality team. They, too, not as good as they were the past few years under Underwood. But 30 to nothing at, at any level is astounding. And, you know, with the, the on the national stage in an Elite Eight game, I just thought that that was uh, absolutely ridiculous, especially since you've got you've got a pro there, at least one in Shannon. Uh, and uh, and a well-coached team. So uh, just to see them steamroll uh, 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 a power five school like that, uh, I, I thought was uh, one of the mo most impressive things, not only in this tournament, but that I've ever seen on the college basketball. Uh, well, then when you go back to and you take a look at what UConn has done, 10 straight games, winning by 13 points or more, 
I didn't do the research, and I don't know if somebody has, but that seems to be historic. I don't even know if UCLA, during its dynasty of the late 60s and early 70s, when they won seven in a row, ever put together 10 tournament games where they won by 13 points or more 10 mm -hmm. consecutive times. Well, then the and question is going to be... covered 13 of the last 15 for, for UConn. They yep. only failed to cover at Creighton in the game they lost, uh, that last loss in Omaha, and they failed to cover uh, against St. John's in the Big East Tournament. Uh, where they won 95 numbers. And always laying, for the most part, huge numbers. Well, the yeah. question then is going to be what happens when they are and do find themselves in, in a game. In a game. Yeah. And I look at this Alabama team, and the thing that I like about them, you could say what you want about scoring and coaching and all that, un, uh, totally understandable, but if you don't have grit, then chances are, depending on what type of team you are, you're not a championship type team. And Alabama just seems to have that type of grit that they're not going to get into a 30 to nothing spell. They're just not, it's not capable. That's just not going to happen. And I think what happens too with some of these teams is I think they're a little bit starstruck with UConn. And I think they're giving them a little too much credit. And I'm not sure Alabama is the type of team that's just going to allow that to happen either. So I think UConn's going to be in a dogfight no matter what. And we'll find out how they respond. But right, last hey. year's last sure. year's UConn team was the exception to what we normally see in the tournament, and that is the ultimate champion has at least one game in uh, winning the tournament, and usually before the uh, championship game, they'll be tested. And uh, UConn was not tested yet last year, at least significantly in the late stages of games with all those double-digit wins. I go back, the one that I always remember was the year UCLA won it, I want to say 95, I think it was, and Tyus Edney had that end-to-end uh, -end run at the end of the game. I think it was to beat Missouri, and then UCLA went on. But that's just one example of many, maybe one that stands out in my mind, of teams winning a championship having to be tested. And Greg brings up an excellent point. Let's see what happens if UConn indeed is tested, whether it be by Alabama or in an ultimate championship game, which would be most likely against Purdue. And, you know, from a basketball standpoint, forgetting the odds and the betting implications, etc., and the other storylines, I think a great matchup. I'd be very, I'd be very compelled by the matchup of UConn against Purdue because I think Purdue, with the three-point sh shooting, and Zach Eady in the center, I think that would present probably the biggest challenge Connecticut will have faced over the last season in this. Quick question for all of you. Better team, last year's UConn team or this year's UConn team? Last year. I'll, I'll, preface, I'll preface it by saying I, I think it was last season's, but yeah. I'm curious in your opinion. Yep. Well, last it's, it's in the history book right now. You know, they've already done that and won it. Uh, this team's in the process of trying to replicate that. So I would say it might be a better question after they cut down the nets to compare the two because they haven't got there yet so far. And what do you I'm, think personnel-wise, though? Uh, well, the, the one thing I – do know about UConn in this run that they've been on last year and this year is that uh, Dan Hurley is going to be wearing the same clothes, the same outfit, the same <laughs> shirt, the same jacket, and everything he's done every game. <laughs> I hope he does laundry in between games. Well, his his wife is the washing machine. machine with her. <laughs> is what she does for the laundry. So he's kind of lucky guy. He's got that covered. Uh, but I think the whole key to this whole thing is uh, the point you hit on here is that. Uh, Andy brings it up about inevitably every good team, every champion somewhere along the way faces turmoil. And the ones that are able to answer the turmoil ultimately end up winning the championship, which UConn is most capable of doing. And they haven't yet faced that turmoil. And uh, my belief is that it's going to come this weekend against Alabama, who I think every team here has motive. There's no question. That's why they're here. They're playing to cut down those nets. But I think Alabama's playing with a little extra motive here in the fact that they were the number one seed in this tournament last year. I don't think anybody even remembers that. Yeah, but they do. And, you know, they're back to finish the job this year. That's sort of my thinking. I To, to me, I think UConn's most vulnerable here. Like, I, I can buy them losing in that they're going to be tested with a style that they don't often see. I mean, Creighton wants to run. Kansas, who they lost to earlier in the season, wanted to run. They were a little deeper back then. Uh, but uh, again, it was it was a, a lower scoring game than expected. That St. John's game that I referenced earlier, that was fast paced and and uh, closer than than expected. Uh, so the, from the standpoint of you're going to make Donovan Klingon get up and down the floor, uh, that that's something that I can buy if Alabama plays with a lead. I think Alabama can't afford to get behind double digits because then UConn style uh, and, and ends up wearing you down and you're rushing shots 
and I'm just not sure that they have the interior depth with Pringle and uh, and Nelson to to stop Klingon. If Klingon gets into foul trouble, Klingon gets tired, then yes, I can buy Alabama winning this game if they shoot the ball well. And therein lies the challenge for Alabama because they're so reliant on their outside shooting that if uh, sure. they're off, if, if Connecticut is able to intimidate them, I mean, Alabama does not do much in the mid-range game. They either go to the basket or they uh, or they shoot uh, shoot the threes. I mean, that's how you average 90 points a game, 91 points a game, whatever. Not just through the regular season, but in the tournament uh, as well with, with Mark, what Mark mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's the challenge. And you're right, Tony. I think the key for Alabama, and you know, and it's, it goes against their style, but maybe they should be a little bit more del- uh, deliberate in this game at least in the first half, to make sure that when the second half starts, it's still a competitive game. Of course, Illinois thought the same thing, and right. uh, it was a five-point game at halftime until uh, 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 until they uh, were hit by that uh, 25 nothing spurt to start the second half, which uh, uh, in itself is probably a record of some kind. But uh, uh, it, it's an intriguing matchup. Now, the, the key here also, or one of the keys, is that uh, unlike the uh, the – Thursday, Saturday, Friday, Sunday games, where you only had a couple, you know, 24, 36 hours to prepare for your upcoming opponent for the Elite Eight after winning your Sweet 16 game. Here, uh, both uh, Alabama and Connecticut, and of course the other teams as well, have four or five days to prepare, and you might pick up a few things. You know, when you watch something on film or on tape, uh, you know, three times you see a few things, and then you watch it a fourth, and you watch it a fifth time, you get to pick up additional things. So I think that extra time may, I don't know in whose favorite works, Probably in Alabama's only to the extent that they're the underdog and they need to come up with more ways of stopping Connecticut, if that's even possible, than Connecticut does not having to watch, uh, having to prepare to stop uh, Alabama. If Connecticut doesn't stop themselves, you know, they haven't done that yet. But, you know, that's what we're talking about is maybe that possibility being out there. Ironically, I mentioned before about Alabama shooting better threes in the tournament than they did in the regular season. Connecticut is drastically worse from three-point land in this tournament than they are during the regular season. They're the worst. They're 28.1% in the tournament. Regular season, they're 36.7%. So uh, there's a team that's down 8.5% from the three-point land where Alabama's up on the other side. So if these numbers hold true, true to form, I think Alabama's got that good chance for the upset. Well, one other handicapping thing. I know you guys are all – aware of this because this is this is a, something that's tried and true in the tournament when when we get to a final four as opposed to what we've seen previously in the tournament and during the regular season one thing to keep in mind is that all these teams play in arenas basketball style facilitated to, for, for strictly basketball arenas and the final four is always in a big, huge stadium where the court is in the middle of everything and the sight lines are different and it's 80,000 people as opposed to 20. Will that hurt or help a team like Alabama that, that um, you know, is, is so dependent on the three ball? Or will that help a, a UConn team that uh, you know, not, hasn't shot the ball well but has really dominated defensively so that'll be interesting to watch it'll be interesting to watch the total one thing that i am fairly confident in is alabama is going to live and die by the three that's been their style it's been their style in huge games like kentucky florida all all the teams that they play they look to jack up you know we're gonna we're better conditioned athletes than you we're better shooters than you this is nato style we're gonna go uh, we're we're gonna go down our way and sight lines don't matter as much when you're constantly taking the ball inside than when you're shooting threes. Absolutely, which is, which is in UConn's favor. Now, if Alabama gets gets hot early, then it all goes out the window and, and their, their tempo will prevail. But it, it'll be interesting to see how they make that adjustment in Glendale. Well, the other thing is also to keep in mind is that you know, everyone, and, and rightfully so, is saying, look at the way uh, Connecticut has been winning games and covering. Well, as I mentioned before, these teams are 15-1 and one against the spread. Now, one way of looking at uh, success against the spread can be, say, you overachieved compared to the lines maker's expectation. So each of these teams has exceeded expectations 
in every one of their wins with the exception of that one situation where NC State failed to cover by half a point. So as much as you can make a case for UConn being a team, now they've covered by a, a huge margin, but the point is they still exceeded what they were expected to do, which is what the lines maker is effectively saying, although, of course, you're really relating the, the lines maker to what the, they expect the public to say, what is the, the fair number on the game? But the point is the argument you can make about Connecticut being so good against the spread in this tournament you can make for the other three teams pretty much as well. So one and you know we know that unless all these games end up in pushes, one of these teams is going to see that huge streak. Again, ignoring that half point by North Carolina State, two of these teams on Saturday are going to see that end, and another team on Monday. Well, for all intents and purposes, guys, we've basically passed over NC State, if you will, largely in this conversation. But we're going to get to them in Greg's question and answer segment here. He's going to throw questions at us, and I know we've got answers. I want to before we get there, I want to remind everybody. That this segment, our final segment, is going to be brought to you by uwager.lv. We talked earlier with Jordan Reed with all those specials, that 70% sign up bonus special. Just log on at UNLV or call them, uh, or I'm sorry, not UN, UNLV, <laughs> uwager.lv. And also, you can also, if you will, call them at 1 800 uwager to take advantage of that 30% added discount. And finally, Greg, before I turn it over to you, I want to let our listeners know out there that if you like what we're doing, please click on the like button down below. Or if you have any questions or comments, we've got answers. Uh, the NCAA tournament is going to be wrapping up here real soon. So hit the like button and subscribe if you will. We're going to be back next week starting some NBA basketball talk, a little bit of Major League Baseball as well. And we'd love to have you join us as a subscriber. So do that. Hit the subscribe button if you will. And with that, Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you, who I know has a lot of interest in NC State at this stage of the tournament. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the question that I have, and I'm, I'm sure there's others out there that might be watching, if, if you put money on NC State like I did before the tournament to win the championship, was uh, right now uh, I, I wagered $25 on them at 130 to 1, which pays about 3250 if they win the championship. So at this point, um, I'll start with you, Andy. What do you think might be, if, if you were in this situation, and I'm sure you have been before, uh, what is the best way to try and hedge some of your cash, even if it's just 500 bucks? Because anything, when you're investing $25, is going to be a win. If you can get back 500, 200, 1,000, half of the 3250, what would be the way uh, that you would go about and do it? I have an idea, but I want to hear what you uh, think of first. Well, first of all, an overview of the hedging technique. There's some disagreement amongst those who are professional bettors, and that is, should you hedge? Or if you like the bet at the start of when you made it, you know, ride it through. You made it because you liked it. And there's some there's validity to both reasons. I happen to believe in the hedging principle because of a couple of things. The idea when you make a wager is to show a profit. Hedging gives you the opportunity to guarantee yourself a profit on the wager, regardless of whether you win or lose the hedge, depending upon when you make the hedge. It's just that your return is going to be a lot less odds-wise if you do the hedge, but you're still going to guarantee your, yourself a profit. To me, the gamble or the risk is to put yourself into a position to guarantee yourself a profit, and that's where hedging comes in. Now, hedging... Uh, usually you talk about one game. Now, the problem that, that or the challenge, Greg, that you have here is that in order to be successful, you're going to have to do two hedges, or you will, unless you decide to just eliminate Saturday and wait till Monday. The problem is that you've got a huge underdog, which is nice, but you're also going to be laying a significant price on the other side to do the hedge. In fact, looking at the current numbers, and they may change on Monday, but right now, if you were to hedge on NC State, you'd have to do a money line play on Purdue at minus 420 to win 100, minus 420 to win 100. And then, and, and by the way, in a sense, you're hoping for that hedge to lose because you'd like to still collect that, sure. that bigger payoff on NC State. So you're actually rooting for your hedge to lose, but you're protecting yourself in case, in case uh, it does win and your original bet on NC State is, uh, is eliminated. Now, UConn, take a look at their line, and it may be similar if it's a UConn-NC State matchup. They're minus 750 on the money line going up against uh, Alabama. So you'd have to lay $750 to win 100 in that hedge, and then you're only halfway home. So the difficulty with doing a hedge, especially two games in advance when you've got a significant underdog, but again, that 
part part of the reason why you made the wager at 130 to one, is that you have to uh, you have to lose two bets and, and to be able to collect on that original wager, which at this time at that point will no longer pay 130 to one when you consider the investment that you've made on the two hedges, which have to go against. Uh, which have to be added to the investment of the $25 that you made originally. So it's a little bit more difficult. You'd have to do the, do the math. And again, you'd have to assume or make some assumptions about what the money line would be if you're going up against UConn. Now, there's always the possibility you could be going up against Alabama. And maybe that's why you, you might end up considering doing a money line play on uh, Alabama to get into the uh, championship as well, although, you, although that wouldn't help you if Purdue beats North Carolina, but it would make it a little bit easier as far as having uh, North Carolina State. If you happen to get both teams into the championship game on Monday, you'd have yourself covered at uh, decent odds. And you also wouldn't have to lay a huge price. Uh, you, I don't know who would be fair. Alabama would be favored over North Carolina State, I would think. So yep. those are the those are the considerations that you have to consider in your mind to determine how you want to do it. It's a lot easier if, let's say, these games were more competitively priced and say you were yeah. laying, say, Maybe a dollar twenty-five on each oh, yeah. of those games. Then you could afford to guarantee yourself probably a win of, I'd say, in the neighborhood of a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars, regardless sure. of how it turned out. Yep. Mark. Well, I can guarantee you this: that uh, if our my buddy Billy Walters was on the show and we asked him the same question, uh, he would say, "Why throw good money after bad money? You don't hedge." Uh, you went into the game looking to make a score, and in this case, it's not like the mortgage is riding on uh, on this basketball game. Uh, so, personally, I would write it out myself. Personally, uh, then it gets to be now. Now we're into the championship game, and NC State's there, and now you can at that point think about making some serious money. But you have to, if you're going to do it, you got to do it one game at a time. I would only look at the the possible head Saturday. I wouldn't care about the other game. Whoever it's going to be, it's going to be. Uh, so if you wanted to hedge your bet, you would do it only in this game. NC State's going to be playing against Purdue and then wait for the game Sunday if they were fortunate enough to get there. But I'm going to apply the Billy Walters theory here and say, don't make a bad bet when you have a good bet in your pocket. Uh, Tony, do you have anything on this? Have you done this before? I do. I, I, first of all, do you have an in-game option? Uh, you mean like a live betting option? Live yes, and that's the only thing that I was thinking of, uh, to tell you the truth, was uh, maybe I just watch early, hope that NC State yep. takes the lead. Hopefully, and then you bet Purdue. And then hopefully I get to like an even money play in a live bet, and then I can go ahead and take advantage of that, yeah. Well, how about Purdue yeah, plus money? Sure. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would think that, look, it, you can even say, I'm going to double down a little bit and throw another 25, 50 bucks on NC State money line, plus 340. And then in game, you can bet Purdue bigger and you can insure yourself a profit of, of some sort. Um, but uh, again, at that point, the yeah. only way that you would want to do that is if NC State takes that lead. Yes. And then the, 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 the in game line uh, is more favorable towards the Boilermakers coming back and, and winning the game and ruining your big bet, but ultimately getting you some, you know, getting and, you paid with a loss. And that uh, might actually be the best. Uh, path to uh, follow because we didn't have this option years ago. We have it now. And in fact, if you take a look at the sure. NBA and Tony, I know you do a lot of work with the NBA. It is possible to have plus plus bets with the volatility of the NBA, yep. especially if the underdog gets out to a huge lead in the uh, game and the favorite is the is now a plus price to come back and win, which happens quite a bit in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that for that, that that's probably your best bet, and for sure you want to having having made this bet already and being as successful in getting NC State to the Final Four, you you got to make some money off it. So yeah, um, and I, and I made sure to wager on every one of their games because every one of their games they were getting. Uh, I put money line action on. I think every game was at least plus two. High plus twos and low threes. So I was still, I've still made money in all four of their games. So I'm way ahead, and I only wagered twenty five on the future. So yeah, um, and I was also thinking maybe I should just even just put a little bit of a, 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 a again, it would be sort of, sort of a hedge bet. But again, because I'm not putting big money here, I could also put a little bit of money on Alabama to beat NC State in yep. the in in the championship exact result. So this way, if both teams do win, I've got the hedge there. I've got Alabama winning. I'm there. If I lose, 
at least I've got that bet. Again, I'd be doubling down in a sense by putting more money on it. But again, when you only wager 25 bucks like I have, what's the big deal? Why not, why not do hey, that too? Greg, Greg, look at this like you're a hedge fund manager and these four teams are corporations and you're charting the path of each corporation and you're talking about NC State and the money that you've made, that you made deposits with, with NC State in this hedge fund with. Uh, so you made H NC State a real profitable position for yourself. That's good. Had you not done that, then you're simply with your simply with your future bet. Yeah. But now you now you've already made your profit. Yes. With NC State. yes. The question is, you know, how much uh, do you want to blow this hedge fund wide open and, and you know roll all the way with it, or manage it along the way? Tony's suggestion about in game is probably ideal to something yeah. like that. Yep. Uh, a little bit more ideal, but uh, just thank yourself. Good job on your part that you did make money with NC State along the way in the tournament. Yeah, they and were... you kind of beat NC State too. Uh, I mean, you could sprinkle some money on that plus four fifty, and a likely scenario if NC State pulls the upset you want, and UConn holds off Alabama, then you've got UConn getting you four and a half. Uh, yeah, and, time your, time and, this, and and this is also one of the situations where, um, <laughs> and this is a good example, but I think you also have to look at it as. I wouldn't always do this. A lot of it's going to depend on because you can get. Um, a little bias sometimes if you're watching some of these games on some of the, like if you have a long shot like this and they're doing well and they make it, you're, you, you, you might be prone to being a little bit biased to the team and how they're playing. But uh, I think I've been doing this long enough to know when I think, I, well, I think I've, I think we've gone as long as we're probably going to go. Let me just hope we get off to a good start on, on Saturday. I'll hedge my bet on a live bet, and I'll be happy right there. Or just don't do anything, like you said, Mark. And I've already I've been ahead, and that's it. But this particular team, the way they're playing, and we can kind of get into the, this preview here, I just think this team still has more to do. I really I really do. I, I, I understand what's going on with Purdue. They could be a team of destiny. We've talked – countless times about the whole Virginia comparison. Um, but I think they're vulnerable in this situation to a team like NC State because they are just so confident right now, Tony, that you throw in scorers like DJ Horn, the big boy who is just an incredible story, uh, Burns, and uh, you just see there's something about this NC State team that says, you know what, maybe they're not done yet. Maybe yeah, Jim Bell Vannels watching them over on top as well. You got <laughs> yeah. It, it's not like Kevin Keats can't coach. It's not like we haven't seen Purdue flame out in this tournament against teams far inferior to NC State. Again, the Wolfpack have a ton of experience. They play the game the right way. My only caveat is this, and this is what I need to see early before I do anything in game, and I, I, I won't divulge which way I'm leaning game-wise, but I want to see – how DJ Burns operates against Edie, because that's yeah. such a different type matchup than yeah. what he's used to. I mean, you're running into a 7-4 guy, and you're reliant on your girth and your touch around the basket. Does that affect you? The, you know, the fact that he's got, what, like an 8-8 eight, eight standing reach, something like that? Or can, can you get around him? If you can get around him, if you can put him in pick and rolls, if you can, if you can get him into foul trouble, then... NC State obviously is is, is live, uh, and, uh, and and again one of those teams where I would expect them to to win. If 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 Burns can, because uh, uh, you know from from that standpoint, he, uh, Burns isn't somebody that Edie sees very often. Yeah, I mean there's there's Dane Danger I guess at Illinois who's who's big and burly, but he get by by far doesn't have the uh, the touch around the rim that Burns has. And, and and DJ Burns finds an act to to get to the to the free throw line too. He's got to make his free throws in this game. That's been his Achilles heel throughout the last few seasons. But uh, again, if he if he has the type of game that he enjoyed against Duke uh, and has has really had over the last couple of months of the season, uh, then NC State can obviously win this game. Yeah, it's also going to be huge, uh, Mark, as far as the officiating, uh, because. Uh, you look at Zach Eady and whether or not, you know, he's getting calls or whatever the case may be. The fact is um, we've seen NC state. We saw them in the game against Oakland where they got, and it was overtime, but they got into serious foul trouble and they had a few of their top guys that were out. 
Um, and even I believe in their last game, um, a couple of their top guys were getting close to being uh, in foul trouble. So that's they just can't afford the foul trouble. And not that Edie looks like he's going to get into foul trouble, but that's the thing North Carolina State is going to have to stay away from. And that's why officiating, especially in basketball more than any other sport, is it could dictate what happens in, in both of those games, especially this one. Andy, have they announced the officiating crew for Saturday that you're aware of? I, I have not seen it yet, but it may have already been announced, and that is a very important point. The other thing is both uh, North Carolina State, they were already tested in that overtime win against Oakland, and to a certain extent, Purdue was tested last week in that game against Tennessee, which I think was, what, about a three- or four-point game with about two minutes to go. So both of these teams have been able to successfully pass tests when they were challenged. Alabama's had a, a couple of, of close calls. Um, the one team, of course, that hasn't is UConn. So, yeah, you like to, you, you can make cases for these teams that have been tested, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Connecticut is the is the one unknown. And again, when you go back to how they played since last year, remember, they were, I think, a number four seed last year when they uh, won the tournament. And as, as Mark pointed out, uh, Alabama was the number one seed last year and, and they didn't make it when they, uh, they got upset in one of the middle rounds. So uh, I, we, it, it can't be overstated how important being tested is because that's when you really know uh, how these teams can respond to. I said at the start of the tournament regarding Purdue because I was not all that certain about them. I wanted to see how they performed in their first three games of the tournament. In other words, if they could make it to the elite, the elite eight and look good in doing so, that's a team that I would not want to face in the finals. And, of course, we've talked about how Purdue, in addition to Edie, has uh, got the – went from one of the worst three-point uh, three shooting teams last season to leading the nation this year, which presents a threat to, against a team like UConn and will present the threat against uh, North Carolina State. But as Greg points out, accurately so – North Carolina State is playing with a great deal of confidence. I mean, they lost their last four regular season games. I think they lost seven of their last nine regular season games, put it all behind them, won five games. Now they had to make a comeback against Louisville in the first game. I think it was the first game in the ACC tournament. And then, of course, by all rights, they should not have beaten Virginia, but for some curious non-decisions made by uh, 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 Bennett of uh, Virginia late in that game that the NC State won. This team is playing with a great deal of confidence. They've overcome, quote-unquote, some mistakes that they made in the ACC tournament to win, and they've done everything right. And that's a dangerous team. I don't want to say they're playing with house money because at this point, the goal is now to win. It's not let's see as far, how far we can go. Let's see if we can win this thing. And North Carolina State's put itself in uh, in that position. So uh, a lot of things can be said about it. There are four great storylines in this tournament, Alabama looking to become one of the first teams to have national championships in both college football and college basketball in their first appearance in the Final Four. Purdue trying to do what uh, Virginia did uh, six, seven years ago by losing to a number 16 and winning it all the next year. UConn trying to uh, uh, win back to back championships for just the third time that's been done since uh, the UCLA dynasty ended about uh, almost 50 years ago now. And of course, I think since 2007 when Florida repeated the feat. And then you've got the NC State, which is trying to do, which uh, UConn did about 12 years ago, and that's win five straight games in your conference tournament uh, and then win the whole tournament. So there are a lot of really, and by the way, if uh, NC State's able to do it, they would end up defeating uh, the team that was looking to go back to back in UConn as the stated before so it's really four compelling uh, uh, storylines i am hopeful obviously i'd like to be correct on these things but i'm hopefully i'm hoping for three really good basketball games this weekend well i think there's a fifth compelling story here andy and it would be can a coach not change his clothes and wear the same outfit for 12 games in a row in two ncaa tournaments dan hurley he'll do it <laughs> hey, uh, Mark, to answer your question, Final Four uh, officials have been named, but as to what games they will rep, that has not uh, been determined, at least uh, not uh, not uh, to the public. Courtney Green, the only official that stands out, is terrible. No ref show, Ted Valentine, which is great for everybody, and some uh, some good refs out there. Terry Oglesby, Roger Ayers, Patrick Adams uh, got the call. Andy also mentioned about uh, Purdue being a great three-point shooting team and terrible last year, and it was largely because of what Painter did, hitting the transfer portal and surrounding Edie with some firepower. For what it's worth inside this tournament here, they're hitting 39% from outside the arc 
I think we're 40.8 on the season. So they're pretty close to even is Purdue. So nothing drastic one way or another for the Boilermakers. So, and we don't have anything then or, or do, or do you on how these particular officials officiate in games, whether they are quick to blow the whistle, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure that's, th- th- that information's out there. So uh, I, I wonder how that's going to possibly affect wagering. Well, uh, Courtney Green is, uh, is whistle happy. That's why he stands out among the, uh, among the whole crew. Um, and the same thing, you know, who's not there is Ted Valentine, who's a ref show. So m- most of the officials that they've named, you know, let, let the players decide the action, which is good. And you'd wish that they would name all officials who let them play and not have that one stand out, one ref stand out who might uh, not let the players uh, play the way they're accustomed to because it, it, it's a physical game and let the players play. And again, the one thing that I ask for in all sports with officiating, be consistent throughout the game. Call a game in the fourth, uh, uh, in, in the fourth quarter or the second half the way you called it at the beginning of the game. The best job an official does is whenever you, you don't notice them on the court. I'm sorry. Yeah, go I, mean, ahead. I mean, who uh, that that uh, that initial Kansas? Uh, who was it? Belmont, Kansas, Belmont game, which th- there was a, a clear block that Belmont probably should have won that game, and uh, it was oh the one was, against Samford. Samford, not Belmont. Yeah, not the Belmont opening game. Yeah. But yes, that, that's correct. And and that, that you know Samford makes that huge comeback, and they get a block there at the end. They should have had the ball to, with a chance to beat KU and. Uh, and didn't because of an awful blown call. And we, we, we see blown calls in every tournament, in every round. Uh, lastly, uh, each of you, before I turn it over uh, to, to Mark to pretty much close the show, um, the tournament in general, uh, Tony, uh, did you learn anything, especially this year? Because we haven't had it like this before with so much turnover, with the transfers and all of that. Yes, we had it last year, but nothing like this year. So if we have it again the same way next year, well, maybe there's something that you learned this year. Is it possible that you can use for handicapping next year's tournament? Yeah, small sample size, but we're, we're going to see whether this trend continues where we have super teams. And I heard it debated last night uh, during the NIT semis. Uh, Fran Fraschilla, who's obviously a respected voice and has been around as a coach and analyst for a long time, saying we might just have 70 pro teams and the rest or, you know, due to NIL because they're all getting paid. Hunter Dickinson is coming back for uh, another year, and it's because he's going to make more money yeah. at KU yeah. than he would, uh, you know, as a second round pick or, or, or playing overseas. And we're going to get a lot of that. We're going to get a lot of we've already seen two of the best guards in the transfer portal go to Kansas. Uh, Louisville, who just hired uh, Pat Kelsey, they got um, the, the best player in, in the Colonial last year out of, uh, you know, w- w- top guard uh, out of James Madison. So, you know, we're going to see this. Is yeah. it going to trans? Is it going to continue to translate the way we did? We saw it this year. Or will that change a little bit? Um, we're going to see. We're going to see what the makeup of teams is. But, but that, that's what I learned. I, are we doing a. Uh, Picks or no, because of, of the thing. Because I do have uh, I do have one thing to offer up. Uh, prop lines. Right. No picks. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. I, and I'll, I'll have a prop column on Caitlin Clark tomorrow at Sporting News on, on Thursday for those of us watching uh, uh, on replay. And uh, also a prop column. I forget which game it is. It's one of the two final four games. Um, and uh, and uh, looking forward to, uh, again, this, this tournament and uh, a free prop that I've already locked in. Uh, I think uh, it, it's DJ Horn over 15 and a half points in, in, in NC State's game. Uh, I just think he's, he's first of all, he's topped that in, in six of their eight uh, postseason games, including the ACC tournament. And the number is 15 and a half at DraftKings. And I think they're going to put it eating and pick and rolls. I trust Horn more than Burns to be the high scorer for NC State in uh, this particular semifinal. Hey, I'm sorry, Tony. I spoke for myself when you asked about free picks. If you want to, you're more than welcome. Or Andy, Greg, you're more than welcome, too. I was just more or less thinking for myself about the free picks. All right. Uh, Andy, did you learn well, anything in particular that you think you're going to use for next year? I, I'm not necessarily learned anything because each year stands out on its own. I mean, for example, we saw the preponderance of favorites uh, do well in this tournament. In fact, through the first 64 games of the tournament, including those play-in games, uh, the line has only come into play in seven of those games where uh, the uh, favorite won but failed to cover, 
and in the first uh, round game between Arizona and Long Beach State, that game ended up in a push. So uh, usually you see a few more games uh, where the point spread comes into play, but part of the reason why it, it, it's, it's relatively low is that the lines are a lot lower these days than they were in years past. So favorites are not being called upon to win by margins to the extent that they have been in, in the past. Uh, we've also seen, of course, with the transfer portal and the NIL, that uh, uh, these teams change a lot from year to year. And so, you know, we were talking earlier, and Tony made the comparison about UConn from last year to UConn of, of this year. It, it can apply like Utah State, for example, a team that made the tournament, returned none of its uh, returning production from last season, and yet they made it into the tournament and made it out of the first round after upsetting TCU and then, of course, ran into uh, Purdue. So I guess what I've learned is you do want to pay attention to a certain extent about the changeover in personnel, but by the time these teams reach the tournament of 30 games, whatever it having played 30 games, they have made the adjustment. So to a certain extent, each tournament stands on its own, but I do like to make comparisons. And I think we talked about it last week with the uh, the seeding numbers of the 16 teams that made the Sweet 16, they added them up, and they were considerably lower this year than they have in past years. In fact, I think uh, since the year 2000, at least, it was like the third lowest of the combined uh, numbers of the seeds, meaning that it was a form-filled tournament. And I want to take that into next year to see how the teams that reached the Sweet 16 have performed relative to previous seasons. Because once you get into the Sweet 16, you've won two and sometimes three games if you're a first uh, first four team uh, and by that time you've proven that you can win in win or go home situations and I want to get I use that to assess the quality of the teams that make the field into the second weekend all right Mark uh, anything in particular before I well, uh, hand it over to you anyway to close it out yeah well and then I'm going to come back to you for your opinion as well Greg uh, uh, what I've learned here is is a trend we're seeing develop and it's and it's going to continue to keep developing and uh tony hit on it andy hit on it uh we are not going to see we're not seeing or we're not likely to continue to see all the massive upsets we saw in the first and second rounds as we have in years past we saw that with nc state uh the only double digit seed to make it out of the sweet 16 and that's largely contributory to the nil uh these teams that are these mid-majors that uh make a little bit of noise and have a little bit of talent on the team, they're being rated. And those players are being gobbled up by the Purdue's, uh, by the Gonzaga's, by the, by, by the bigger schools. And I think as a consequence, we're not likely to see as many of what we were used to in the past, these double digit seeds, surprising winning basketball games in the first two rounds. That's what I've learned this in this tournament. Yet at the same time, Mark, and I think you pointed out in the newsletter, we yet again have another double digit seed re reaching the uh, uh, the final four, which is not all that uncommon. And certainly getting it into the second weekend, meaning you generally pull two upsets, is not that uncommon. The question is key in on which of those double digit seeds. Uh, would be the most likely. Now, this year, you would have not expected NC State to be that team based upon going into the tournament. Yeah, they won five games. But then when you take a look at the fact that the other three teams that advanced into the Sweet 16 did so from that same conference, you realize that maybe NC State is not as much of a surprise, but it could not really have been anticipated by anyone other here than Greg, I suppose, uh, that they would make it into the Sweet 16 and Final Four. But it sort of says the ACC, which has been a down conference in, in recent years, maybe they weren't quite as down as we thought they were this year, and certainly after Virginia lost that game. And, and as a Power Five, though, they're not a Cinderella. And it's, you look at that roster and, and the experience, you know, it, it's, it's not your typical mid-major, obviously, Cinderella. Exactly. All right, Greg, uh, you being uh, the, for, the fortuitous uh, prognosticator, you have NC State alive this weekend. I know you learned a lot from choosing a team like that. That's, that's, your, that's in your DNA. You like those, those meaty dogs that can return, uh, yield a return. But what have you learned in the tournament that uh, maybe you didn't know before this tournament started? Well, I, I, Andy brought it up, and, I, and that is going to be that next year when I go over my brackets, I'm not going to be so easy to uh, – throw well i gotta put a couple of upsets here and a couple of upsets there because it always happens well no it didn't really happen last year uh that's how i'm gonna feel next year so i'm gonna say all right i'm gonna have to be really precise and say okay well if i do like an nc state 
well, maybe I only like another team and that's it. I have to be very careful, especially in bracket contests. Uh, I have to be very chalky now and see how that goes because I do believe that that's the trend. And but I do. But as as you also brought up, it, it does not mean that that 11 C that NC State is not going to be able to go on a run because I do think those teams will be able to. It all is still going to depend on brackets and you know what, what are they in the right. Are they in the right region? For instance, if NC State just happened to be in the same region as UConn, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably not picking NC State to get to the Final Four. So, uh, so that's also going to come into play. But bottom line, yeah, I'm going to probably tend to be a little bit more chalky next year. Well, there we go, guys. Uh, we need a real nice overview of heading into the Final Four weekend, the championship game on Monday. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with all of our panel of experts Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Tony Mejia, playbook experts and contributor to Sporting News, and Greg De Palma, the producer of the show from Prime Sports Network. We're going to be back next week, so mark that down on your calendar. By, by the way, ex yes. excuse me, Arthur, one thing, yes. you talked about selections. One thing that you may want to consider, and it seems to work almost every year, and it makes a lot of sense, especially when you transition from the arenas that hold, you know, 18, 20,000 to these stadiums that hold, you know, 65, 70,000, is you may want to look under in the first half of the games on Saturday as the teams get used to playing. Yeah, you've had a chance to in practice get a look at the sight lines, but now you're going up against people who are trying to defend you and stop you and, and force you into doing things. You normally have that feel-out process anyway, but when you move to these big stadiums, it may take a little bit uh, – a little, a little bit of time to get used to it. Now that could also create not in addition, not only in addition to uh, playing unders in the first half, but now with the in-game wagering, you could also take a look at possible situations where you might want to put uh, put full game wagers based upon low scoring, say in the first four minutes after they adjust the totals for the game somewhat, especially based upon the style of the teams that uh, come into these tournament games. Like going to the eye doctor and him putting those drops in your eyes and he dilates them and all of a sudden you, you don't see so clear. Let it work a little bit. In the second half, you're, you're seeing and performing just well. Exactly. We might see that in these big stadiums. Good point there, Andy and Tony, as well. Well, guys, we appreciate your joining us here on the show. Be sure to tune in next week when we go up against the spread on the podcast here, talking about NBA, a little bit of Major League Baseball. Until then, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.